Can you tell me, please, Len, how did you become interested in radio drama? Well, <laughs> I um, got out of university during the Depression, and there were no jobs around, and I owned a typewriter. And uh, so uh, th that's uh, why I plunged into it. And I came from uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, and was discouraged uh, from getting involved in, uh, in literature uh, there because, uh, and writing, because the things uh, that I wrote uh, were too disturbing to the uh, people of uh, Saskatchewan and Regina. Uh, for instance, I uh, entered an oratorical contest in my first year of high school. Uh, and I picked as my subject Louis Riel. This is in the early 30s. And I went to the library for the first time in my life and did some research and prepared a zinger of a speech. And I envisaged myself as being champion boy orator of the statue. But I had to uh, submit the speech to a teacher before uh, exposing it to an audience. And, uh, which I dutifully, dutifully did, and I got my speech back with eight of my ten minutes blue penciled out. So <laughs> I didn't even get on the platform. <laughs> and um, well, when I uh, wrote for the, uh, for the high school paper, uh, they didn't like what I uh, wrote about uh, the teachers and themselves. And I got uh, tossed off the paper very shortly. Uh, my problem was that I was very like uh, that little boy of Hans Christian Andersen uh, who watched the uh, king go by uh, naked and uh, hollered out, he has no clothes. And throughout my writing career, I've taken that attitude. I've looked and reacted and wrote. And, 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 and how I got in, uh, interested in, in writing, and when I went down to uh, Northwestern University in Chicago, uh, I was uh, by then persuaded uh, to be uh, interested in science and maths and sports and so on, because uh, literature and composition were not for me. But I was astonished. Sorry, 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 sorry. Could we just take that last comment from when you went to Chicago? Uh, yeah. We just had a little accident here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Same one. I think you were about to tell me why you chose your yeah. course of study down in Chicago. Um, all right, so. When I went to uh, university in the States, I was astonished to find that uh, the, t the professors wrote on the uh, uh, edge of my papers frequently, Peterson, you're a writer. And uh, didn't seem to make sense to me, but uh, anyway, it was, it was kind of pleasant to get that. And then one of my teachers took one thing I wrote and sent it in to the uh, producer of Columbia Workshop in Chicago. And this was uh, the big prestigious uh, drama in the United States at the time. And the producer asked me to come and see him, which I did. And uh, he said he liked uh, the piece that I'd wrote, that I'd written, and asked me what I was going to do after I got out of college. And I said, hell, I don't know. There's a depression out there. <laughs> and he said, why don't you write? Well, I didn't have any better ideas <laughs> to make a living. And uh, so when I came to Toronto, uh, the CBC had just that year established its drama department. This is in 1938. And uh, uh, so I uh, sat down and pounded out a radio play. And at that time in Canada, in Engli English Canada, there were only uh, three small markets. One, the new CBC uh, drama uh, department, uh, McLean's Magazine, uh, Liberty Magazine, that uh, were publishing a few short stories, and the book publishers who would publish maybe three or four novels altogether per year. 
That's how barren it was. Well, I, I couldn't uh, take time out to write a, a novel because I needed some bread. And so I sat down and uh, didn't know very much about how to write a play for radio, but I reasoned, well, why don't I just describe what comes out of the mic, out of the speaker? <laughs> so I did, and threw it into the CBC, and they bought it. And so I've been corrupted ever since. Would you recall what the content was of that very first script that you wrote? You know, the, the title or anything, who played it? Yes, I was uh, obsessed at the time, as all young men are, with uh, the romances in their lives. And uh, I'd had a kind of torrid affair just <laughs> before I left college. And uh, so I sat down and wrote about that. And it was called, it happened in college, and was uh, uh, the romance between a uh, college boy and a college girl. And Did you self-censoring in that? Me pardon? Did you self-censor at all in that? No, no, it, it was fairly straightforward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, in Toronto, who, was the fo who were the people you dealt with at the CBC office? Well, the head of the drama department in the uh, late 1930s and from its beginning was Rupert Lucas. And Rupert Lucas was a uh, former actor who, who became a, uh, a director and producer and head of the drama department. And uh, like so many actors, he was very full of his own career and importance. So when I went to this talk to him about <laughs> my script, we spent all our time talking about his career and his acting. <laughs> And he uh, thought that um, Radio Fair in this country should be uh, the uh, marzipan, uh, uh, simple um, uh, boy and his dog uh, kind of uh, plays, or else Shakespeare. And um, I, I wasn't interested in writing either of those, uh, because I was very hot uh, reacting, about reacting to my Milieu. Uh, I had uh, spent my youth trying to survive the depression and the drought and uh, other disasters uh, that were close to me and I wanted to write about those. And I was exposed to um, European and, and American literature in uh, college and uh, so it seemed very straightforward that I should, uh, you know, write about the, the things that I felt hot about, and which I did. Uh, I saw no point. Well, I didn't. Life was a matter of life and death. And I felt, too, the drama should be about life and death, the struggle. Uh, at the same time, uh, I wasn't always serious and stark. Um, I've always had a, uh, a humorous side to me. And uh, so the things that I wrote uh, ranged uh, between uh, being pretty hot-headed and stark uh, to being pretty clownish. And Rupert Lucas uh, didn't feel that uh, the stuff that I wrote uh, was quite suitable uh, for uh, uh, the center of... Uh, English uh, Canadian Broadcasting in Toronto, and so he sent my stuff out uh, to the provinces and thought it might be okay for them. <laughs> and in Vancouver we had Andrew Allen, in uh, Winnipeg we had Essie Young, and in Montreal we had Rupert Kaplan. And Andrew Allen, uh, he was in England uh, when the war started. Um, and doing broadcasting. And uh, he decided to come back and boarded uh, uh, at the beginning of the war and boarded the Athenia with his father and his girlfriend, Julia, uh, yeah, Judith Evelyn. Well, they weren't far uh, out of Britain uh, when their ship was uh, torpedoed and sank. And uh, 
Andrew and his father and girlfriend uh, got into a uh, lifeboat. Unfortunately, a rescue ship uh, came along uh, where they were to pick them up. Unfortunately, the uh, pr propeller smashed up their lifeboat and they were in the water. And they were able to grab uh, fragments of the uh, of the lifeboat uh, to float on. And there were many hours uh, hanging on uh, Andrew's father and Andrew and uh, his girlfriend. And then uh, there were other people too. And one by one, uh, Andrew saw uh, people losing their strength and slipping away. And uh, he told me that his uh, reaction was not one of sympathy, but one of anger. You know, God damn it, hang on, hang on! Uh, he, he was picked up, uh, and his girlfriend, uh, unfortunately, his father slipped away. Um, well, it was experiences like that, uh, having his nose rubbed in reality, uh, that made Andrew uh, take a different approach to, uh, to drama in Canada from those who'd up to that point had a fairly comfortable life. In addition, Andrew's father uh, was a, a clergyman who was interested in the, uh, in the benighted and did a lot of visiting uh, of jails and prisons. But that gives you some idea of the kind of man he was and, uh, and his attitude towards uh, human beings and, and particularly those who are on the short end of the stick. And uh, so, that's Andrew. Essie Young, uh, he came, uh, in, who was in Winnipeg, uh, he came from uh, Sweden, and he'd gone to the uh, uh, Royal Academy of Drama there, and decided that he wanted to uh, come to the New World, and planned to go it was either Chile or Brazil. <laughs> but he got waylaid for some reason or other and ended up in Canada. <laughs> Never got to South America. And uh, he settled on a uh, homestead in Manitoba and very soon discovered uh, that the land that was given to him was submarginal and shouldn't have been settled. And all around him were other uh, uh, Scandinavians uh, in the same situation. He started a, pay, uh, a Swedish newspaper in Winnipeg and began to write about uh, the stupid uh, settling policies of the Canadian government. Uh, the uh, Mounted Police became rather uh, disturbed about him and his criticisms and uh, spotted him as a radical <laughs> and went around to see him. But uh, eventually he was able to, to charm them uh, and to uh, uh, show, uh, you know, with statistics, statistics, statistics and so on, uh, that uh, uh, his criticisms were valid. <laughs> and, and so uh, uh, the Mount Police became quite friendly with him. And uh, uh, so he too, uh, you know, had his nose rubbed in reality and uh, was receptive to, uh, to fairly uh, uh, straightforward and, and blunt statements in drama. Then in uh, Montreal, we had Rupert Kaplan, uh, who began uh, his, his drama experience with the Providence Players uh, in the States where O'Neill uh, worked and so on. And um, uh, he was also Jewish, uh, which was a little uncomfortable uh, for him in Canada and Montreal. And so, so he too 
uh, wasn't a, uh, a smug uh, fellow uh, uh, sitting uh, comfortably in the uh, um, master race uh, culture. Uh, so I was uh, lucky uh, to have these uh, three fellows out in the, in the regions uh, send my, my things to. And um, so I, I got a fair amount of action uh, right from the word go. There are certain connotations to Midwestern Scandinavians in terms of their political leanings being socialist or slightly left or center left, right? Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about uh, Winnipeg and the trouble, uh, the, the, the potential labor trouble was in the shadow of the 1919 rebellion and all that trouble out west? No, after the war, the general strike, yeah. yeah. General strike stuff. Yeah. So it must have been quite hot, the concept of, uh, yeah. of so socialism. And, 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 and Regina, where I, I grew up, yeah. was the place where uh, uh, the CCF was organized and uh, was also the place where uh, Louis Riel was uh, tried and hanged. And uh, it was a hot subject, although I didn't realize it. Uh, when I plunged into it, uh, uh, preparing my first uh, public speech. So you have no fear of controversy per se, uh, or at least you. No, no, no. Uh, except uh, in school and Sunday school, uh, we reacted uh, to what we saw and heard and felt very bluntly, and uh, <laughs> uh, I was. Uh, uh, chased out of Sunday school uh, by the superintendent uh, because uh, when things were said and you were supposed to accept them, I, I would see uh, a funny side to it and make a joke. And uh, so I was turfed out of the Sunday school and uh, then uh, I stood and, and looked in the window and that disturbed the, uh, the Sunday school. So the superintendent the superintendent <laughs> came tearing out after me to chase me away and uh, I had hidden in the weeds a leather bull whip uh, which I just stood and reached down and grabbed and I was what, eight years of age or something like that at the time <laughs> and, and he was going to give me a thrashing. And I just stood there with the bull whip, whip and invited him to come on me. And he didn't. But, you know, that's the spirit that, that I had then. Were you exposed to drama or were you exposed to radio drama as a child? Yeah, I, I was a, a child elocutionist and uh, was invited to, uh, to go to the Sons of Scotland and the Sons of England and, and uh, various other uh, associations and... Uh, and recite, uh, you know, funny poems. And I, I was very good at it and, and, and became, uh, you know, uh, noted for it. And I entered uh, uh, elocution contests and, and gathered a lot of medals and so on. Uh, but it was a, a foolish time of my life. Pre-television. So what was the uh, pre television and, and uh, you know, these were the days of uh, radio of uh, Amos and Andy and uh, Jack Benny and Eddie Cantor and all that kind of stuff, yeah. And I, I went to a lot of, uh, of movies. I had a paper route so that I could afford to go uh, to movies and between the ages of, uh, oh, t a 12 to 15, I suppose I'd go to four movies a week. Yeah. And at the same time, I was uh, very active in uh, in uh, gymnastics and picked up a fair number of uh, of medals in in that, and um, uh, was also uh, captain uh, and quarterback of my uh, football team at Luther College. The one year that I was able to take college in Regina, and. Um, we had a good record too. We uh, played eight games in the season, won seven. Not bad. <laughs> we had a light team, but we had uh, uh, a lot of uh, fast, uh, dodgy players. So 
uh, it was with that that uh, we won. And and then and then I also was uh, uh, a wrestler. And uh, when I was 17, I uh, uh, won a Saskatchewan wrestling championship in my weight. Have you treated those years at all? I explored them in your writings. Uh, that you're growing up, people you knew, uh, Regina per se. Uh, I did. Uh, well, it's impossible not to. And. Uh, <coughs> But I had uh, those kind of eyes uh, that uh, when I looked in a mirror, uh, I didn't see a reflection of myself, uh, but the glass was removed and I looked through the frame at other people. And so um, my soul uh, is created uh, watching and reacting to other people. Uh, so that uh, empathy and sympathy uh, is very natural to me. And, and in that way, I uh, collected thousands and thousands of characters. And uh, one time when we were uh, playing a game uh, describing, uh, describing someone else uh, through various aspects, and Andrew said, he saw my brain as hundreds and thousands of people uh, tearing around <laughs> like mad. <laughs> and uh, that caused me for a while uh, to write a kind of play that um, was absolutely marvelous, uh, but we only had it for a few years in radio. And that is, you would build up a, a society and a drama with, with social tensions and so on, um, using hundreds and hundreds of characters, each one with only one line or one speech, or in a scene where there was an exchange maybe of um, uh, two or three lines between two people. And in that way, you know, uh, we built a, uh, you know, a wonderful, uh, uh, painting, as it were, with words uh, of our society. Unfortunately, uh, when we organized uh, the uh, uh, Performers Union uh, in radio, um, we were concerned about uh, actors getting as much as possible uh, when they were hired. And uh, before that, uh, when, when an, I, uh, an actor was hired, he could do as many doubles, triples, quadruples, and so on uh, as was needed. And the actors got very good at changing their voices, changing their accents, and so on. And, you know, it was a real caper uh, for, the, for the whole uh, cast. When, <laughs> you know, they'd play one part, and then they'd bounce uh, away from the, uh, from the mic, and they'd have to uh, gear themselves uh, selves up for a totally different character. And, and come on again with a different accent and so on. Uh, so that, you know, that was a, a very exciting kind of, uh, of radio. And it would be great if we could uh, do that today, but it, uh, it's impossible with the uh, union, re union regulations. Can you please step through a, a typical evening or a morning of a radio drama, going down to the, st to the, uh, to the studio, what street it was on, a couple names? Yeah. Just go through, kind of go through one typical, doesn't even have to be a real one, just a sort of prototype. Well, and the, the atmosphere uh, that we had in the early days of, of radio, uh, that's extremely important. Um, because of uh, Andrew's experience, Andrew Allen, and Essie Young's and uh, Rupert Kaplan's, um, they were interested in presenting life as it is uh, with the problems that we were facing then. And so uh, when Andrew Allen started his stage series in 1944, he came to a number of writers and uh, said to them, I want three plays from you, three from you, three from you, and so on. Deliver them to me, and 
I will produce them as delivered. No changes. If I feel a need for a few changes, you and I will sit down and discuss it, and then you will, you will make the changes. In other words, the writer was given total freedom. That was rare, a, a, you know, a revolution. Nowhere in the States was that allowed. Nowhere in Canada. And Andrew uh, uh, came to that policy also uh, through talking to, to some of uh, the writers about uh, how they felt drama should be done. And Andrew, uh, well, and, and I'll speak about that later. I'll, I'll, I'll get on to... Uh, uh, in all the plays that I did for Andrew, hundreds of them, I only changed one scene in one play, and that was all. Now, in the United States, uh, CBS gave Norman Corwin a certain amount of, uh, of freedom. Uh, and Arch Obler was given a little bit. And the result of their give, uh, being given a, a certain amount of freedom resulted in those two writing plays uh, that were outstanding, that were different from anything that was being produced in the States. Uh, and, and people reacted and thought, wow, isn't this marvelous? But the formula was simple. Give the writer freedom to pursue truth. And that is what we got from the CBC in those early days. And so, I would deliver a, a script, and if it was too hot, the producer would slip it in his drawer and lock it, and then just bring it out the day of or the day before <laughs> the production uh, and run off copies. Uh, so it, it was a good idea uh, not to have officials get a look at it before it went on the air. And these shows were live. So that we got them on the air and then answered for them <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> and you would go in the studio and look around. The actors, the sound men, uh, the musicians, uh, the technicians, uh, the director, they would all have a great sparkle of devilment in their eyes. Oh God, here's one we can get in trouble with. You have no idea the zing that put in all the performers and in the musicians and in the sound people. Oh God, it was wonderful. And what this meant was that we felt we were creating a country. That is glorious. That topic right away. Say when? Yes. Give me five minutes, please, warning. At the end? Yeah, he was talking, Gino was talking about 10 minutes, that's why I couldn't give him my intro. Great, okay, okay fine. I'll just see your hand in that, and okay, that, sure. that'll be fine. Thank you. Okay, anytime. Okay. What would have been different had your scripts been submitted to uh, sponsors, say, the, uh, the maker of the soap company, and looking at your latest script? What would have changed? What would have happened? How would it have felt different? Well, <coughs> Uh, when uh, shows began to be sponsored, uh, and that began in the very early 20s uh, in New York, in, in one station in New York, 
and uh, Lee de Forest, uh, who invented the uh, tubes necessary for uh, radio broadcasting, uh, when he heard that, uh, he said, Oh dear, what have you done to my child? Uh, he understood uh, that uh, when um, broadcasting became commercial, that, would, that it would be a different animal. And uh, the uh, shows that, that shook this country, uh, they were all uh, non-sponsored shows. And uh, the CBC, of course, did a lot of them. And uh, it wasn't just in uh, drama that we did drama. Uh, virtually every department of the CBC uh, called on us playwrights uh, to, to write dramas for them or documentaries uh, dealing with aspects uh, that they were interested in. So that um, our uh, dramatists were not artsy-fartsy, uh, but were combining uh, reality uh, with, with fantasy. Uh, and uh, we learned very well uh, the uses and misuses uh, of fantasy. And uh, I feel that that is one of the great problems in our society and in government uh, and in confrontation between countries is that they are unable to sort out what is reality and what is fantasy. And it creates for us enormous problems and could end unless we begin, become skilled in separating the two, it will end in the destruction of mankind. That's how serious I feel the issue is. You were referring to the feeling of changing a country and uh, naturally you're working at state radio. We're yeah. not used to, you, you, were, you said, uh, you were talking about every department at CBC. We're used to a corporation of 30,000, 40,000 people. So I'd like your <laughs> impression of what the CBC was really like, the one you worked for early yeah, yeah, on. Yeah. And uh, who the devil were these folks that felt they were changing the country? And who were they? My yeah, yeah. name. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> we thought we were changing the country and plunged into it. Because we didn't see anything more important than that. And though that involved interpersonal relations and romance and so on, we at the same time felt uh, that the needs of the country uh, to look at itself, see what its problems were, explore them and look for solutions it was vital, vital, vital. And of course, we'd had the experience of the Depression, which was desperate. Uh, we'd had the experience of the First World War and we're in the Second World War. So life, uh, life was pretty rough and ready. And we had the experience of the big lies of the Nazis and the fascists and the communists and felt that it was very necessary to address lies of all size. And that's what we did. And that was a terrible shock. Uh, to the establishment, um, to the privileged. Because uh, you ask questions uh, which might threaten uh, their position and their hold uh, on the loot of the country. And, and so uh, it was because of that attitude that we got into no end of trouble. But it was wonderful trouble. And uh, 
I ended up, uh, you know, with howls of uh, protest from uh, members of parliament, um, from executives of the CBC, uh, from various uh, uh, special interest societies in the country, uh, from business people and so on. Um, but fortunately, at that time, we had as the head of the CBC, uh, Davidson Dunton, uh, who came out of uh, uh, newspaper work in Montreal and then uh, was up in Ottawa uh, as a, uh, a wartime uh, a bureaucrat. Um, uh, he was a special darling of uh, Mackenzie King's and Young. Uh, but he was very open-minded, and he understood uh, the game we were playing. And I would frequently get a call from uh, the head of the, uh, the CBC, Davidson Dunton, and he would say to me, Peterson, what have you done now? And he would ask me uh, about the play and uh, what the circumstances were and, and my reasoning and so on, which I would deliver to him. Uh, and then he would use that to, uh, to answer the, uh, the protesters. Uh, you know, so and, and we needed that backing uh, from um, uh, bureaucrats in the CBC too. And, and there weren't very many bureaucrats. And it didn't take very many people uh, to make a show. Uh, we had the writer, uh, the director, uh, the uh, technician, one on the board, one sound man, the actors, the musicians, and that was it. You know, we, we could very easily make a show uh, with, with only five people. Now you look at the credits. You know, that roll on and roll on and roll on. All the people who in one way or another are involved uh, and start mucking things up and make it more complicated. Also, the technology then was very simple. And the more technology you get, the more problems you have in making a simple, blunt, straightforward, worthwhile statement. And eventually, as the uh, technology gets absolutely marvelous, everybody forgets about finding a worthwhile statement. They get so enamored, so caught up with the the wonder of the technology, the glitter of the technology, that there's no drama left. You know? So actors go to acting school uh, in, and end up getting in and out of cars, um, you know, shooting a pistol, uh, diving away from an explosion, and so on, and do damn all humanistic acting uh, where the heart speaks and where the head speaks. Oh, it's terrible for actors, you know, I, I really feel sorry for them stuck with that kind of acting. Pause tape, please. We have a few writers that were your early comrades. When did you first meet Lister Sinclair? Well, that was uh, uh, after Andrew had come from Vancouver, and I first met Andrew up in Ottawa. Uh, a lot of uh, Andrew's writers were in the armed forces, and uh, I was in the army. And um, uh, Andrew came to Ottawa because uh, uh, that was the headquarters of the CBC, and he wanted to speak to the, uh, uh, the president of the CBC. Uh, but also, uh, he knew that a, a lot of the writers that he was interested in getting to write for him were also in Ottawa. So uh, he turned up one day, and he was a very uh, suave gentleman um, with a Homburg uh, on his head 
and a tightly rolled umbrella and a, uh, a very neat gentleman's suit. <laughs> and uh, he started out being rather formal, uh, but then eventually that broke down uh, and he became our Mephistopheles. And uh, he was open to anything and everything. And uh, uh, Lister, uh, and, and after Andrew came down to, uh, to Toronto to start producing, uh, his gang of, uh, of writers and um, actors in Vancouver uh, followed him here because they figured, oh, this is where the a action is in Toronto. And uh, so that's uh, when I met uh, Andrew Allen and uh, the Draineys and uh, Lister Sinclair and, and that whole tribe and the Draineys and so on. So you were already an old hand around here? And I was an old hand around here, yeah. yeah. Do you recall the first controversy on something you wrote? The first biggie? The, the first biggie. Uh, well, uh, the first uh, real big trouble uh, took place the, the first year of the uh, State Series and when I wrote a play called They're All Afraid. And uh, I had a girlfriend then uh, who told me about uh, the terrible uh, problems she was having at, um, at Bell, where she worked in the office. Uh, and when I looked around, I noticed that nearly everywhere I looked, I saw timid, frightened people, afraid of their, of their job, afraid of their position, afraid of what they might say, and so on. And so I thought I'd write a play about that. So I uh, uh, created a drama about a young lad working in an office who had the experience in one day of discovering very vividly that at home his parents were timid and didn't speak out and were afraid of their livelihood and everything. That day when he went to the office there were a number of incidents uh, which made him con conclude that all around him were people who were afraid. That night he went dancing with his girlfriend and made proposals to her, uh, which she <laughs> turned down. Uh, and, you know, he was ready to explode, uh, went to the, rest uh, to the restroom in the place they were dancing. And he had no, so no sooner got in the restroom, and there was a colored uh, man there uh, looking after the place. Uh, who followed him around, uh, handed him a towel, uh, turned on the faucets, uh, and then pursued him around, whisking him in the hopes of getting a ten-cent tip. And that was too much for this young man. He exploded. And hauled back and slammed uh, the washroom attendant in the face. The next day, after thinking about it, he thought, oh God, I better go back and apologize to that colored washroom attendant, which he did. And that is where my play begins. I have this young lad then tell the attendant all that happened that day which caused him uh, to hit out. And his point was, 
nothing personal in it. I wasn't really hitting you, you. But all this timidity around me. And for Christ's sake, you too. Why do you grovel like this? Why don't you stand up and be a man? And at the end of the play, uh, the, the, the young man says, and after I told him all, all that, and forgetting all that, I reached in my pocket and pulled out a $10 bill and gave it to him by way of apology. And I hoped he bloody well wouldn't take it and show his pride. And the last line of the play is, but he took the ten. Well, <laughs> after that it went out on the air. The next day Andrew Allen got called on the carpet by Ernie Bushnell, the, the head of the English Language Network. <laughs> and he blasted Andrew. He said, God damn it. Here we are in the middle of the war. And our job at the CBC is to build up the morale of the populace. And you put it on our network at the prime hour, 9 o'clock, Sunday night, a play in which you declare in Canada we are all afraid. Well, Andrew, who was very smart and very quick and clever on his feet and with his tongue, he said, Oh, and oh, uh, Ernie, don't you understand? We are fighting the big lies of fascism and Nazism. And therefore, the point Peterson is making is that here we must speak out and not hide behind lies. Well, Ernie Bushnell wasn't too happy with that <laughs> argument. <laughs> but he accepted and said, well, go a little easy, eh? Well, then, at the end of the uh, season, Andrew uh, was invited uh, to make a submission uh, to a, uh, a radio uh, conference down in uh, Ohio, uh, Columbia. And he sent in, they're all afraid, as uh, our drama submission uh, to compete against the American networks and uh, the BBC and so on. Well, not only did this play, they're all afraid, win the top award in drama, it was also given a special citation as the best submission in all categories. And Ernie Bushnell, representing the CBC, was down at this conference and had to get up and accept the award on behalf of the CBC. <laughs> so he, he did it very graciously. Uh, he said, well, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't like this play when it went on our network. I still don't like it. But thank you very much. And we were some time in understanding why the Americans reacted so strongly toward this play. Eventually we understood. This was before there were uh, 
any movement, any protests in the United States urging the blacks to stand up and stop groveling. So this was a shock to the Americans. And they reacted very favorably to it. But that play didn't go on in the American networks. Great story. But what is Baker's Dozen? Uh, Baker's Dozen, uh, that, that's the number 13, uh, because um, uh, Baker's, back in history, uh, had their bodies uh, severely damaged if uh, someone bought uh, a dozen buns and it turned out there were only 11 in the, uh, in the bag. <laughs> and so, to be on the safe side, bakers uh, would count out 13 <laughs> and put them in the bag. And so, and at that time, um, the schedule of broadcasting uh, was in clusters of 13. And uh, Andrew and uh, Fletcher Markle decided to do uh, a series of, of 13, all written by Fletcher and all directed by Andrew. And that's why it was called Baker's Dozen. And it made uh, quite a stir. And this was before the stage series. It was produced uh, from Vancouver. And Fletcher uh, was a very dynamic, a uh, very bright, a uh, very creative person. And he was impressed uh, by Arch Obler and uh, Corwin and Orson Welles uh, and saw drama as going that way. Uh, I was uh, more impressed uh, with European drama and uh, classical drama. Uh, and uh, the, the more radical drama of the States on, on the stage. And that was the direction that I went. Uh, but Fletcher and I, uh, uh, we were very simpatico, you know, uh, before we met, because he played in some of my plays that were done out in Vancouver. And then when we met, we, were, we became very, very close friends. Um, and uh, Andrew, or at least uh, uh, Fletcher Markle, was also one of the uh, uh, the uh, writers that uh, uh, were the, that key group that Andrew started with, and Lister Sinclair was another, and Joe Shule, uh, and uh, Tommy Tweed, and so on. Tommy Tweed is a writer. Oh yeah, Tommy did a lot of uh, of writing. He was uh, a uh, a Canadiana buff, and uh, wrote a lot of uh, absolutely marvelous uh, uh, comic dramas uh, about the uh, history of the country. I have a quote here, which I'm not going to go through the whole thing, because uh, we've covered so much of it, but I see the quote, the term, thank you, I see the term uh, high seriousness. Uh, Alan accomplished the combination of his new technique, a dramatic technique of Alan's, um, combining, a, combining social and moral message with a new high seriousness. Now, this high seriousness I'm grabbing, what's that? Do you have any idea what that means? Oh, yeah. Uh, there were some of us who felt so strongly uh, that certain things needed to be noticed and uh, spoken about and acted upon in this country that we didn't feel uh, we could soften it in order to make it palatable uh, to our audience. So, come hell or high water, it had to be said, it had to be produced, and it had to go out on our airways. And we did. And we also had the attitude that if we were uh, denied total freedom, we were willing to become ditch diggers, street sweepers, <laughs> and so on, if necessary. 
We felt that strongly about it. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I find generally, except among the mad, the, uh, the people who are most serious and the brightest people in science and math mathematics and so on uh, are also the funniest. And the, the, the people who, who just go in uh, for jokes and being funny, uh, they end up uh, being rather superficial. Mm. I think it's rude to talk about money these days, but I think it would probably be safe to talk about money in the early days for you. Was it a uh, well-paid uh, profession, uh, residual stuff like that? How did it work? We started out being paid $25 for a half hour. And then it went up to $50 for a half hour. When Andrew started his stage series, it went up to $100. Now, uh, during the war, uh, a number of uh, the CBC writers uh, were also uh, writing for the armed services. And so, uh, what we were paid by the armed services uh, kept us alive and what we got uh, doing an occasional play for the CBC was gravy. But when the war ended, uh, we had to live totally on what the CBC paid us and it was not enough. And so at the end of the uh, first season after the war, I looked at my uh, balance book and said, good God, I ain't going to survive on this. I'm eating up my savings. So I phoned Andrew Allen and said, Andrew, got a problem. And so he said, what is it? And I said, I can't live on $100 per play from you or from many other producers in the CBC. I need to have double that amount of money. And uh, Andrew said, oh, you do, eh? And prior to phoning him, I had phoned his stable of writers and told them that I was going to phone the CBC and threaten Andrew uh, with withdrawing my services unless he doubled my fee. How do you feel? You want to go along? Can you live on that, what you're being paid now? And they all reacted positively and said, hell no. <laughs> okay, we'll go along with you. So I had that ammunition uh, with me. And when I spoke to Andrew and, and told him my stand, uh, that I would uh, you know, sooner get a common laboring job than continue th this way. And I said, and oh, by the way, Andrew, uh, you will find when you phone uh, Lister Sinclair, uh, Tommy Tweed, uh, Joe Shule, and so on,